basically field trials. Um, but I don't think it's too early to anticipate the possibility of a situation arising in which suddenly there is um, a, a great deal more fear than there currently is, um, uh, coming much more rapidly than the scientists anticipate, clicking in. And, and at that point, there we could have a real mess on our hands if there are no rules whatsoever. Um, so what I'm saying is anticipate the need for having uh, a basic principle, which is thou shalt not mess with the atmosphere unless everybody agrees in some globally representative way. And the criteria for judging this have to do with uh, meeting a very heavy burden of proof. You have to demonstrate that the benefit to be achieved decisively outweighs the negative consequence. And I would say, and this is the important point, you have to demonstrate that this is not a substitute for mitigation. Because if it is, it's the equivalent of heroin addiction, uh, basically. You, once you start, you can't stop. Um, and that you, you have not affected the underlying carbon buildup, so it is acidification in the oceans and all that is keep going. You might explain why you Can can't stop. Yeah. Suggest you why you can't stop. Um, yeah. You cannot stop because the technique that will work um, only works for a year or two. You put particles up, they come down within a year or two. The carbon dioxide stays for a century. So his bathtub analogy is... The but reason. the bathtub has continued to fill. So if, if you stop, suddenly you get a whopping big temperature increase, right. which right. just raises and, and, ecosystems. Um, and, and we're messing around with the rate of temperature increase. I think it's fair to say we're projecting a rate of increase that the geological record has never seen. Um, so we're messing around already with, with global balances that could conceivably put everyone at risk. And the, if you want the nightmare scenario that might wake everybody up and suddenly make this a much bigger deal than it has been. It's the possibility of, of uh, a surging release of frozen, frozen methane, gross gas hydrates, that would pr- produce a positive feedback cycle. Um, and, you know, that, that cr- could create an image of, of real catastrophe. I mean, real catastrophe that would seize everybody's imagination, way out in front of what the scientists could really sort out. Um, and that's been hypothetical. I've been saying this for a couple of, about a year since we've been talking about it, and people have been saying, yeah, but it's, you know. Um, but they've just measured. They've just measured it in the Arctic shelf. Um, and uh, uh, it's the first observation, but I would say we ought to pay attention to that because um, this is a potentially very big deal. Bottom line of all this is we need to start talking about it in terms of the government is- governance issues. Um, what kind of rules do we need to put in place uh, to provide adequate vetting for any uh, initiative? And unfortunately, it's not just big governments that could do this. It is small governments. It is <coughs> billionaires probably could figure, I'm going to save the world all by myself, and I won't bother to mention it. Um, uh, so you've got a, prob- a situation in which Small initiatives could have a global effect, um, and that, and we don't have any rules for dealing with that. And I'm saying it's time to start talking about the rules. I concede that um, on this subject and in general, it's not popular to talk about global rules. Um, um, so I'm telling you, however, we're looking at situations that's going to make it necessary, like it or not, and we ought to about start thinking about it. Please. Can, can you mention what bodies you might have in mind? You mentioned uh, um, an informal set of bodies through National Academies of Science that could work on these. Uh, are, there, are there other bodies you think that would be well-suited that you can imagine to take this responsibility? Or Well, you can imagine the coordinating mechanisms of the National Academy of Sciences working out some kind of understanding among them. Mm-hmm. Um, and making themselves kind of maybe the global <coughs> equivalent of an institutional review board for, for medical practice. You know, if you do any, any experiment on human beings, you have, to, you have to justify yourself to institutional review boards to do it independent, that, that you're, not, you're, uh, you're not subjecting the subjects to unnecessary risk. I think they could, using that analogy, they could set up uh, a basic mechanism and understanding on the way Granger's talking. Okay, if you're operating within these fairly narrow 
or limits where we don't think there's going to be any major global consequence. Do it on your own, or you can do it on your own, but there are disclosure rules, transparency rules. You've got to publish what you're doing. You can't hide it. Um, if you go beyond these limits, and the limits need some agreement, um, then there has to be, I would say, some common vetting process that they would have to organize among themselves gl- collectively. We all have a stake in that. And, uh, um, and I would say it's good to start talking about just that much. But what happens if tomorrow we get sort of somebody announced, okay, we've got frozen gas hydrates coming out like crazy, and unless we stop this, we're all dead. Um, and people start believing that. Um, what do we do? Uh, at that point, if you're talking about real emergency things, I'm saying, well, if you're looking at the only mechanism we have at the moment for global vetting, you're talking about the UN Security Council. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to go through that. And if you don't like that, then then think of something else because don't think that you can do this on your own without triggering real, real reaction. And and uh, this is uh, it is this is something that. Um, if people think there's a, they're going to get excited about, it. they're going to get really excited about. It. You're not going to be able to act unilaterally. Say, I. Um, a couple more comments on sort of coordination and who might do what. As I mentioned, the Royal Society has done a a, a study that, among other things, introduced this very useful distinction between uh, solar radiation management and uh, carbon dioxide removal. The Royal Society is getting geared up right now to do a second round of work on uh, global governance issues. It'll be an informal kind of thing. In the paper that John and I and and our co-authors published in Foreign Affairs, we also raised the prospect that ICSU, the International Council on Scientific Unions, might be a candidate for uh, coordinating uh, at least research activities among uh, uh, different uh, research groups around the world. I want to uh, reiterate what John said, which is I think that any research in this area needs to be open. I think it would be truly disastrous if you know, we discovered a few years from now that uh, there was a black program that some uh, government had stood up to sort of learn on the, on the quiet how to do this. Um, and um, I also think that we do need to get a serious research program going because the, the sorts of events that John's talking about, that is a, a climate catastrophe of one sort or another, are still way out in the, probabili- in the tails of the probability distributions of our uncertainty. I don't think there are very many scientists who would say they're high probability events, but they are out there. There is some, I mean, it's not zero. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to be in the position of suddenly deciding you've got to do something dramatic quickly if you haven't studied it and you don't know what might happen. Right. Just one list of a bit. The burden of proof on the moment, quite appropriately, um, falls very heavily on anybody who wants to proclaim a catastrophe. You have to demonstrate to confidence that um, <coughs> um, it will shift in public a lot sooner than it'll shift among the scientists. Um, and if it did, if, if some image of public catastrophe started to take hold, it would be very difficult to disprove it also. Um, whoever, when you're dealing with out on the tail low probability events, whoever carries the burden of proof to say it might happen, loses. Um, and so what you have to worry about is some image of catastrophe that takes, seizes broad imagination, and the scientific community cannot disprove it. Um, and you could get that. This frozen gas hydrate thing has some potential in that regard. Um, so, so you started the session by saying many people look at this and think it's a really awful idea. And I agree. And I think that's actually a good thing that many people look at this and think it's an awful idea. Uh, I mean, messing with the planet is not something one should do uh, lightly. And actually... It was very interesting. The Russian participant at this workshop we ran in Portugal reminded us about various Russian attempts to, you know, redirect rivers and otherwise engineer the landscape and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pointed out that there was a lot of hubris here and it didn't work out too well. 
you don't want to. So if if you do as a 